Australia's naval modernization is driven by a very specific strategic logic. The country understands its geographic position, its limited population, and its budgetary constraints. It cannot and will not attempt to build a navy measured by tonnage and quantity against giants like the United States or China. Instead, Canberra has chosen a different path, a maritime force built on sensors, automation, hunter-killer anti-submarine capability, and distributed strike potential rather than surface dominance. This approach reflects not just military theory, but also public sentiment in the Australian society, which values defense without aggression, deterrence without provocation, and transparency in national spending. This is rooted in the Australian worldview that the country is not an interventionist power. It does not seek to control sea lanes outside its immediate strategic environment, nor does it pursue a forward deployment posture akin to the United States. What Australia wants is something more foundational, the ability to ensure that no actor, whether a regional competitor or external power, can coerce or isolate it within its maritime approaches. With the steady rise of Chinese naval deployments across the Western Pacific and deeper into the South Pacific, Australians increasingly recognize that naval strength is not a luxury, but a necessity. Rather than building a large fleet, Australia is building a smart fleet. A smart fleet is one in which each ship makes every other ship better through shared networks, data fusion, and cooperative threat engagement. It is a fleet designed around advanced electronics and underwater awareness. This approach emphasizes force multiplying capability rather than force massing capability. Instead of a navy that tries to be everywhere physically, Australia is building a navy that knows everything in its waters before a threat even arrives. The Hunter-class frigates exemplify this shift. These vessels center on anti-submarine warfare. They are not designed to intimidate visually, nor to strike symbolic poses in naval parades. Their value is invisible. They detect what others cannot. The CEA FAR2 radar, developed within Australian industry, represents the maturation of a truly indigenous defense technology sector. It enhances situational awareness and supports integrated air and missile defense. Furthermore, these ships use domestically produced steel fulfilling a long-standing public expectation that national defence spending should circulate back into Australian manufacturing and labour markets. The success of the Hunter-class project is therefore both military and industrial. It serves as a test of whether Australia can sustain sovereign naval construction capacity without full dependence on external suppliers. If hunter-class frigates provide the eyes and ears of the fleet, the Ghost Shark program may become its silent teeth. These autonomous underwater vehicles expand Australia's ability to gather intelligence, perform reconnaissance, and undertake offensive tasks, such as mine deployment or surprise attack, without risking human personnel. Australians have shown strong enthusiasm for this program precisely because it avoids the moral and emotional burden associated with submarine crew loss. Soldier lives are not placed at stake. Robotics takes the risk. Equally important is the ecosystem behind Ghost Shark. More than 40 Australian companies participate in the program. This ensures technological ownership, industrial participation, and long-term intellectual development inside the country. The cooperation with Japan on the Mogami-class frigate procurement represents another layer of strategic thinking. 
Japan is not merely a supplier of equipment. It is a partner with shared values and convergent strategic interests. Australians view Japanese defense technology as reliable, proven, and efficient. There is no national historical baggage or suspicion attached to Japanese security cooperation in the same way there sometimes is in debates over United States military influence. The Mogami design reflects a philosophy of operational efficiency, small crew, large capability, long range, economical maintenance. It is an understated but sophisticated design, perfectly aligned with Australia's smart fleet concept. Technology and combat platforms, however, are only half of the transformation. The other half lies in governance. For many years, Australians have become frustrated by chronic cost overruns, schedule delays, and bureaucratic fragmentation within defence procurement. The establishment of the Defence Delivery Agency marks a decisive shift in institutional culture. Instead of multiple agencies and committees diluting responsibility, procurement and sustainment are now consolidated. This restructuring is widely supported among ordinary Australians, not because of ideological enthusiasm, but because it satisfies a deeply pragmatic instinct. Citizen taxpayers want competence in management, not slogans in strategy. The public mood is clear. If the nation is to invest tens of billions of Australian dollars into naval modernization, the execution must be tight, transparent, and accountable. One of the most important elements in this transformation is how Australians perceive their own role in regional security. The country does not aspire to become a dominant naval actor like the United States. Instead, it wants to ensure the stability of maritime trade routes on which Australia depends. With 90% of Australian imports and exports transported by sea, Naval security becomes economic security. This is why maritime awareness and sea denial capability have been prioritized over blue water power projection. Looking forward to the 2030-2035 horizon, the blueprint becomes clear. Australia will field a layered system of naval assets, ghost shark units for persistent underwater presence, manned submarines for deep-range deterrence, hunter-class frigates for anti-submarine warfare dominance, and Mogami-class multi-purpose frigates for flexible regional patrol and escort operations. These layers will not operate as isolated platforms, but as a harmonized system of sensors, communications, and strike options. This is maritime defense as a cognitive network, not as a lineup of ships. Ultimately, the Australian strategy is built on a well-measured principle. Credible defense is not the opposite of peace, but the condition that preserves it. Having warships does not mean wanting war. Maintaining deterrence does not mean preparing for aggression. The modernization of the Australian Navy is not about expanding the country's reach, but about protecting its space. It is not a competitive naval arms race. It is the construction of a shield. The deeper insight is that Australia's strength will not be judged by how many ships it has, but by how capable each individual unit is and how effectively those units communicate and coordinate. The question that increasingly shapes Australian naval policy is not how big should the fleet be, but rather how knowledgeable and adaptive should the fleet be. Australia is building a navy for an age when information matters more than armor when intelligence matters more than bulk, and when invisibility can be deadlier than visibility. 
This is a navy designed by pragmatists, supported by citizens, and optimized for the defense of a maritime nation that values independence of action and security of passage above all.